everybody, and welcome to the beginning of the end of 2021, where I get to do the oh-so-algorithm-friendly list week, starting now. Not exactly the beginning of the week, but uh, it might last until next week. And today we're going to be going over my top 10 reads of 2021. Exciting stuff! Now, more than a few people have commented on the fact that I haven't done many book reviews recently, and there's a very serious answer as to why. You see, I had eye surgery, <laughs> so still now it's hard to focus on tiny letters and I've been restricted to pretty much only audiobooks. And on top of that, I have been a bit burned out. So there have been a few books I've consumed in the last month and a half that I have not reviewed, but in general, I'm just focusing more on stuff that's better for the channel that I'm less burned out on. Book reviews will be returning though in the new year for sure. Now I do wanna make one other thing clear that I often see confusion about in these videos. This is not best books released in 2020, it is specifically best books I have read in 2021. Everyone seems to think I'm trying to be like the Oscars or something. No, this is just, hey, this is the best stuff I read in 2021. I think you might like it too. Let's go. Speaking of let's go, let's go and start off with talking about some honorable mentions in no particular order. I didn't order these from best to worst. They're just some books that I also really, really loved and would be remiss not to mention in this video. Starting with Xenos, the introduction I personally had to the Warhammer 40k literature universe and was maybe the biggest surprise of the year. I quite ignorantly went in expecting some schlock based off a board game that wouldn't hold a candle to some of the best sci-fi fantasy I read, and I was entirely wrong. While I don't think it's a perfect book or absolutely the best of fantasy sci-fi literature, it is definitely throwing with some of the heavyweights of 2021 that I read, and it's totally worth the investment. I plan on reading more Warhammer in the new year. Next up, we have The Lost War. This was an indie release that I just found to be extremely charming and actually have a twist that was successfully landed brilliantly, not something you always see from an indie author, and I recommend you check it on out. Then we have Pawn's Gambit from Rob J. Hayes, an author who I think is absolutely slaying it and may be the most underappreciated putting out books right now. His whole Immortal Technique series absolutely underread, needs more eyes. The Black Tides of Heaven was a book that I found to be maybe too smart for its own good. The concepts and premise here are outstanding. It's just that in execution, I wasn't exactly as invested as I feel the book required due to some choices that were almost unavoidable due to what the book was covering. So I'm very conflicted about how I feel about this one. I highly recommend it, but I just couldn't put it in my top 10. And the last honorable mention will be a book I actually haven't had a review for yet, and that's going to be Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. This was a really surprising book from Neil Stevenson, whose only other literature entry I've read up until this point was Anathem, which you can say is a bit different than Snow Crash. And seeing that level of diversity from the author alone is impressive enough for it to get a mention here. But on top of that, Snow Crash is just freaking great. And if you're into the cyberpunk aesthetic, it's a must read for me. But okay, let's go ahead and start the official top 10 list. And we're gonna go ahead and kick it off with a book that I had problems with, but is actually maybe the book I have recommended the most this year of anything I've read. And that's going to be the Song of Achilles. I, again, had almost no expectations walking on into this one, but was pleasantly surprised at what turned to be a refreshing and nuanced take on a classic story. The new angles provided by the author's pen were refreshing and actually made the story more relatable than I found it to be initially, despite some complaints I had about a over-the-top character I don't feel landed as well as the author wanted it to. The Song of Achilles is a book I don't have here in front of me because of how much I've given my copy to others. It's now lost. Thank you, Sarah. I, I don't need it back at all. And while this is a book I may have heavier criticisms than a lot of the other entries on my top 10 official list, it's also one I have kind of a stronger beating passion of love for because it's doing something I've been asking for fantasy to do for quite some time, which is to go back into the classics era more often and give it a fresh spin. I really enjoy seeing authors doing that. Next up is going to be Fugitive Telemetry, the latest entry in the Murderbot series. And Murderbot is going to be something that people know I am just a tremendous fan of from basically the second I picked it up. And it's not gonna be surprising to see this entry on my list. What I will say is adding new to the conversation is after I have reread some Murderbot and I have kind of done some more pondering on the series, I really think the novella format is 
perfect for what this series needs to be. And for some of the weird reasons I can't quite place an exact thumb on, the actual novel size entry has floated down to be one of my least favorite murder bot stories. So I am maybe the most excited for this adaptation of any we are getting. Yes, it's being adapted right now. And this smaller, quicker format may lend its structure to being perfect to adapt. This might be the most adaptable series you're gonna see mentioned in the entire top 10. Maybe the best cover of 2020. One we have at number eight, the shadow of the gods. Seeing John Gwynn kick off a new series with such amazing success is just heartwarming because when authors start having larger and larger back catalogs for new readers, it can be impossible or borderline so to start their newer work. And so I love that John Gwynn has provided an entry point where he is at the top of his craft and people who are curious about his writing can jump in for a brand new series that is going to display all the things his fans have been preaching about him for years and something that's not going to come with the complete baggage of a finished series, which some people do want to avoid. There are actually people out there who want to read a series as it comes out. I think they're weird. You are if you're that person. But you do exist, and I will acknowledge that. And at number seven, we have a book I have yet to review here on the channel as well, and that is going to be Leviathan Falls, the latest entry in the Expanse series and the conclusion. What I have to say is... God damn. This series was actually written by two authors using a pseudonym, and it has never felt that way to me in any of the negative ways, where it feels like two different disjointed voices, but it has felt like that in all the positive ways, where it feels like there are just great ideas that are fully thought out and discussed through and through. And one of the things I was most nervous about in terms of all the themes and storylines that The Expanse had set up, could they actually be resolved in one story? The answer is yes. In the words of Ryan George, it's tight, 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 tight. Everything so thematically, satisfyingly resolved, unless it's not meant to be. And I won't get any more spoilers. I'll wait for another video for that. Beyond saying that, this was just exactly what I think The Expanse needed. And you're gonna get a lot of extra bonus points for me if you are actually ending a series that strongly. So good job for Leviathan Falls. The Expanse is now done. And that's just, we can say it's a solid sci-fi series through and through and recommend it confidently. Is that not a wonderful feeling to have for something you love? Good God. At number six, we have one book from a series that I really struggled to pick just one entry from because I finished it this year. So I may have just defaulted to the first, but in my heart of hearts, I think it might actually be my favorite. And that is going to be Hyperion the first entry in the Hyperion series. This is a sci-fi classic that I personally hadn't picked up until now. And now that I have, I'm wondering why? Why did it take me so long? Why isn't this talked about more in the circles of GOAT fantasy series? It's solid all the way through. I don't get all the dissent I see around the second half. And me personally, Dan Simmons is now probably my top five sci-fi authors just from this series alone. It's a repackaging of the Canterbury Tales told in a way that is far more beautiful than many of Dan Simmons' contemporaries at the time and still feels fresh and original today. I am in love with Hyperion and this, yeah, it earns the spot solidly. Next up was we have another book that I lent out and don't have a physical copy of, Really Professional Daniel. Cut in, not because of corrupted data, which you'll get later in the video, fun fact, because I screwed up titles here. I accidentally said Mad Ship when I meant Ship of Magic, which was the strongest of the Live Ship Traders trilogy for me. I actually have finished Ship of Destiny now, and I thought it was as good as Mad Ship uh, maybe a little bit worse, but in the end, I like Ship of Magic the most, though when I've spoken on these in the past, I've confused their titles. Yay! Uh, but really what I want to start focusing on more after finishing this trilogy is Robin Hobb's influence, because considering when these books came out, I think her influence is far greater than I've previously thought, and I need to look into that. Because she's also, I've noticed, on many of my current modern New Age favorite fantasy authors lists of biggest influences, so that might be something worth ponder and I get why so many people try to read the Assassin's Apprentice and get turned off there because it's so I just not as engaging in the action sense as what a lot of authors are putting out back then and now but I implore you to give Robin Hobb another chance and do the live ship traders trilogy instead no you do not need to read her other stuff to enjoy it it stands on its own aside from a few references and taking place in the same world 
please give it a read. At number four, we have Dark Age by Pierce Brown, possibly the glow up author of the list because after reading the first Red Rising book, I probably would have just said, oh, I don't like Pierce Brown as an author very much, but this man has evolved and grown and sharpened his craft where so many of the areas of his writing were so caked and bits I didn't like that needed to be polished off. I couldn't even see the strengths that were there, but I'm happy to report as of Dark Age, Pierce Brown has shed so much of the clunkiness of his early writing and truly become one of the great voices of epic modern sci-fi. And he's telling it in such a brutal, visceral way. I feel very confident in recommending it to just the grim, dark fantasy fans out there who normally don't like sci-fi, to the most hardcore analytical sci-fi readers. And Dark Age is just such an inspiring thing to see because it's proving this author is just polishing their craft and polishing and polishing. I cannot wait to see the quality of Pierce Brown's writing in 10 years. And at number three, we have what a lot of people will probably have assumed be number one, but I'm oddly going to be taking this as just one whole series because I couldn't necessarily break it up. And that's going to be the entirety of One Piece. Now, before you attack me for just considering it one story, please know from my perspective and a structure standpoint, it really was. I'm now caught up. I've gone all the way through to the latest release and I binged this series. I didn't take the breaks a lot of people normally get. And so for me, it's just been this cacophony. And instead I'm just gonna say as a whole, this has earned the number three spot and it's one of my favorite fantasy series of all time. The reason it's not at number one or two though, were yes, there were definitely some arcs which are notable in size that I found to be severely lacking in quality. But from a character perspective, this feels like the most uh, effective and genius use of the advantages of the manga medium and when the anime is actually at its top form, that medium as well, to tell a story with such heart and passion. It is to me personally like if Terry Pratchett decided to write a manga series. There is so much here that I find reflective of Discworld, which is one other one of my all-time favorite fantasy series. There is humor and characterization that just pumps off the page that is utilized to tell such interesting thematic stories that have so much to say while never feeling preachy. I am a massive One Piece weeb, and thank you all for bullying me into reading it. And if you've been paying attention on the channel, you know there are two books that I have read that I have considered of just beyond exceptional quality. And it's been very hard for me to pick just one to be my favorite of the year. It's not an easy thing to make myself do, but after a lot of debate, I've decided that my number two spot is going to go to the wisdom of crowds. This really is equally on par with Jade Legacy in nearly every sense. The only reason I'm giving it the number two spot instead of the number one was I had a bit more of an emotional response to Jade Legacy as a reader than I did Wisdom of Crowds. And an awkward cut in because I lost a bunch of footage due to a corrupt memory card. Yay! But basically what I was saying here is a bunch of really impressive things about Wisdom of Crowds now it proves Drew Abercrombie is definitely one of the best of the era. Not something many people are going to disagree with. And on top of that, there is this super impressive trend throughout Drew Abercrombie's work where he's able to just evolve and enhance themes through these characters and their arcs and play them together to evolve and come together. And now through this generational level, it's just immaculately executed. And now back to what I was saying. Most impressively, taking the generational leap he did and actually making me enjoy the characters here more than that of the original First Law trilogy. Something I would have considered impossible because you become so emotionally attached to the characters that welcome you to a world, it just doesn't make sense that a generational new later comer in Zeus would actually pull at you more but through the utilization of the parental dynamics that come with just a moving forward like this, Joe Abercrombie played with me as a reader and made my love and affection just grow all the stronger for these terrible, awful people we're following for this new trilogy. And at no point did he neuter any of the previous characters. They are just as lethal and relevant to the story as they should be with who they are. Age of Madness, in my personal opinion, is even better than the original First Law trilogy, and I am eagerly looking forward 
forward to whatever's gonna come next in this world. This book is flawless. The number one spot and the book that to me goes beyond flawless and exceeds all possible expectations I could have had, we have Jade Legacy. I was a bit worried that this was gonna be the Star Wars format where the first movie's good, the second book is great, and the third one has problems, but no, instead we have the first book in the Greenbone Saga is good, the second book is great, and Jade Legacy is probably the cleanest finish. Another awkward cut in because of lost footage. Cleanest finish of everything in 2021 is what I was saying, and of recent sci-fi fantasy memory, so. Sorry, it's not my fault. The card, blame the card. This is not an easy concept to bring home in a satisfying way. We are, by the nature of this story, following characters who are going to be very difficult to all find satisfying conclusions for, and Fonda Lee absolutely did so in a way that got tears out of me. Just feelings of love and joy, passion and sympathy for people who are an active crime syndicate. That should not work as well as it does. This is truly the godfather of fantasy, but I would argue because the godfather trilogy is trash by the end of it, this is better. <laughs> Watching these people get pulled into the inevitable whirlpool of destruction that having this type of family provides is just so emotionally tantalizing. And without getting too deep into spoilers, the way this book ended made me remember one of the greatest TV show endings of all time in Six Feet Under. It's not quite as dramatic as that ending, but what you get here feels on that level of emotional just beauty and how it is just tearing at every single bit of emotional bond you have built over the last three books. Fonda Lee has crafted, in my opinion, the strongest fantasy trilogy of recent memory. But hey, all of this is majorly subjective and is just my takes. I would love to see your top 10 list in the comments down below to influence what I start picking up in 2022. If there's some stuff that's cracking a lot of y'all's top tens that you've read recently, that's going to push it onto my radar. But let me know what you thought of my list as well in the comments down below. Like and subscribe if you have not already and hit the Patreon to support what I do here. Have a good one, y'all. Peace.